We don't know that Jesus is all we need until Jesus is all we have. If you'll turn with me in your Bibles to the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 1. <clears throat> and we're going to look at verses 1 through 11 this morning. So we'll pray, and then we'll go into the message. Father, we do thank you. Oh God, we don't take it a light thing. We don't call it a light thing. We don't consider it a light thing, Father, when we come before your people, Father, and you, and we come before you looking for you to feed us, to speak to us. Lord, I'm not worthy to even utter your name, let alone speak your word. And it's only by your grace, Lord, that we're all here today. We just want to say thank you. So, Father, forgive us of our sins and our trespasses and anything that we may have done, O oh God, that is contrary to your divine nature. God, we ask that you would sanctify us this morning, Lord, and remove anything in our lives, and our minds, and our hearts that is not of you. Father, we need you to speak to us this morning. Open your mouth this morning, Lord. Use these old dumb lips, Lord, to speak to the people, Father, these lips of clay. I ask God this morning that you would stand in my body, that you would think with my mind and speak with my mouth. We want to hear your words, Lord. Hide me behind the cross in Jesus' name. I pray, amen. The subject of our, of our study this morning is going to be the subject of suffering. And the title that we're using for this subject is Comforted to be a Comforter. Comforted to be a Comforter. Now suffering, we, we know that suffering is not a topic that we like to hear about. It's not something that, and definitely isn't something that we like to go through. But the fact of the matter is that it's a part of life. And those are things that we just have to endure. In fact, Billy Graham, Billy Graham said that suffering is a part of the human condition and it comes to all of us. The key is, to, the key is how we react to it, either turning away from God in anger and bitterness or growing closer to him in trust and confidence. So my question this morning is, how do you react to suffering? How do you react to trials and tribulations? Do you draw near to God in those times? Or do you run away from God? You know, the enemy would love for us to run away from God in the time of suffering. He likes to use that time to try to separate us from the body. In fact, when you think all through history, you know, we want to, you know, the enemy likes to try to use suffering and afflictions to try to get his people, to try to get the people to turn away from God and to turn back to what we know best, back to the world. When you think about the, the Israelites, when they were coming through the wilderness, every time affliction arose, they would murmur and complain and want to go back. They would turn away from God instead of turn to God. And even when it came to Job, we know that the enemy, the devil, tried to use, that was the very premise that he tried to use to get Job to turn from God. He tried to use affliction. He tried to use suffering to turn him away from God. But just hopefully we can say the same thing that Job said, that though ye slay me, yet will I trust you. And we can stay with God. So I want to encourage you this morning that if you are going through a trial, don't run away from God. Run to God. Suffering as a Christian is not something that might happen to us. It's not something that could happen to us. But suffering is something that will happen to us at some point in our lives. Jesus even spoke about this in the, in the, um, in the word of God. In, in John 16 and 33, Jesus tells his disciples, he says, you know what? In the, wor in the world, you will have tribulation. Now, he didn't say you might have tribulation or that you could go through something. He said you will have tribulation. But then he gives them a blessed assurance. And he says, but be of good cheer. For I have overcome the world. Or in other words, I have conquered the world. Now, suffering can come at a moment's notice. You can be riding down the street and everything seems to be going fine. No problems. And then suddenly out of nowhere, you hit a pothole of affliction, of adversity. And you find yourself 
suffering. Well, this was made very real for me just recently, a few weeks ago, when I got a call from our oldest daughter in Harrisburg. And she let me know, she informed us that they had found a, a growth, a mass, a large mass, as a matter of fact, on her uh, pancreas, near the tail end of her pancreas. And even though at, that, at this particular time they're saying that it's precancerous, but they really don't know until they get in. So she's scheduled for a very significant uh, uh, surgery coming up on the 25th of this month. They're probably going to take about 70% of her pancreas. They're taking her spleen, and they're going to take her lymph nodes. My baby is only 40 years old. So we understand that these things can happen in a moment's notice. No warning, just happens. So of course, immediately we begin to pray. But even more than that, I realize that as a father, as much as I want to protect my baby, as much as I want to be able to take care of this foe and to get him away from me, to get him away from my family, this isn't one I can fight. This is one that's bigger than what I can handle, but I do know who can handle it. So we immediately began to pray, and the saints began to pray. So anyone at any time and anywhere can suffer or experience affliction or tribulation. Well, <laughs> we know that the Apostle Paul was no stranger to suffering, no stranger to suffering. In fact, in his second letter, in this uh, second letter to the Corinthian church, Paul shares some intense thoughts about a time of his suffering, but he doesn't neglect to give praise to the merciful God who got him through it. And if you look at Psalm 103, we see that the psalmist gives praise to God for his mercies, for he is the God of mercy. So what I'd like to do is just read uh, some of the scripture. We're going to read down to verse 3, and then we're going to get into the study. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who were in all Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and God of all comfort. I want to stop right there. Well, we know, and we've read the word enough now that most of us know that when Paul reads a letter, when Paul sends a letter, he generally has a very similar address. But one of the things that I really like about Paul is that he's not in the titles. He's not in the titles. Paul acknowledges his position as being an apostle, but he never refers to himself as the apostle Paul. It's Paul. But he also realizes that he is an apostle, and not by his own will. It's not that he earned it, but he's an apostle by the will of God. It's not self-will. You see, he didn't appoint himself to be an apostle. He couldn't have earned that, but he is apostle by the will of God. And just as we are called to serve the Lord, none of us are self-appointed Christians, for real. We are all called with, into purpose, we're called into position, and we're called into fellowship with God by the will of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, Paul writing to the church at Corinth, he says, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. So we are called out by the Lord. And not only are we called to be saints, not only are we called to believe on the Lord, but we're also called to suffer for his sake. And that's a part of the thing, that's a part of the Christian walk that we really don't want to, to look at. But we are called to suffer. And that's according to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 29. But glory be to God that even though we are called to suffer and we will suffer, we have comfort in suffering. In all the suffering and trials and tribulations that Paul has had to go through, he never focuses on the, on the issue itself. He doesn't ask to be delivered from it. He doesn't complain. He doesn't bellyache. He doesn't talk or murmur about his circumstances. But what he does do is that he praises God and acknowledges God, God's grace in comforting him in the suffering. Look at what it says in verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. That blessed, when he says blessed be the God, that blessed actually translates into worthy of praise is God. That means God, because God is worthy of praise. 
And that's worshiping. That's giving praise to God, regardless of what she's going through. It doesn't matter what we've gone through in the past, and it doesn't matter what we're going through right now. It doesn't matter what we will go through in the, in the future. God is worthy of praise. He's worthy of praise. In Psalm 145 and 3, the Bible says, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. And I love, I love what uh, uh, David said in Psalm 34 and 1. He says, I will. That means I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to make a choice. I will bless the Lord at all times. That means it's not conditional. It's not conditional. I'm not going to just bless him whenever things are going well. Job said, you know, should we just take the good from God and not the bad? He said, I'm going to bless you at all times. His praise shall continually. That word continually, that means I'm going to have a perpetual praise in my heart. And it's going to be on my lips, a perpetual praise. I'm going to praise him in the morning, praise him in the afternoon, and praise him in the evening. Regardless of what I'm going through. And you know what? That's exactly what the Lord would have of us. Because he is the Lord and he is greatly to be praised. And then he talks about the father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Now this word father actually translates, it's a Jewish meaning. And it translates into the word originator. In other words, he's saying I'm the originator of mercies. Another word for it is beginner of or source or giver of mercies. Isn't it good to know that when we need mercy? We can get it from the originator. (laughs) We can go to the highest level of mercies, the person who supplies mercies. He gives it to us, and he gives it from a source that is unending. He has an unending supply of mercy. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4, Paul says he is rich in mercy. That means there's an abundance of mercy. My God. In Psalm 118, he says, oh, give thanks for the Lord. For he is good, and his mercies endure forever. There's not a time that you can have or need God's mercies and he not be able to provide it. And then he says he's the God of all comfort. And this word God also refers to source. So he's the source of all comfort. And to me, that's a picture word. I think about a well of water or a a, a spring that you find out in the field somewhere. And if you find the source of that spring, it never ends. It's constantly running water coming out of that spring. And that's exactly what God is. He is a source. He is the source of comfort. Now, we may want to find comfort in other things. We may want to find comfort in other people. We may want to find comfort in activities. We may want to find, some of us like to find comfort in food. We may want to find comfort in, in, in reading other things. But the source of our comfort ultimately comes from God. Now, don't confuse the word comfort with the word sympathy. See, sympathy means that I can identify or I can agree with your feelings. Yeah, you're hurting, and I can agree with that, but I can't give you no help. Sympathy doesn't give us any help. But comfort actually means help. You see, comfort is the Greek word paraklesis, or paraclete, which means coming alongside and help, to come alongside and help. Well, we've seen that word before, right? (laughs) We know that word. It's the same word that's used for the Holy Spirit, the comforter. The comforter is our help or our helper. Jesus said in, in, in John 14, he said, if I go, I will send you another comforter. I will send you another helper. When I go. So comfort is help. When God gives us comfort, he's giving us help. God encourages us through his word and by his Holy Spirit. And he uses others to comfort us through his Holy Spirit. Now, as we move into verse uh, four, we see that Paul answers three simple but important questions about God's comfort and suffering. Look at what it says in verse four. He says, who comforts us? in all our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which, with which we ourselves are comforted. Well, so he answers a few questions. The first thing he answers is, who is it that comforts us? 
Well, Paul obviously repeats this a few times because he wants us to understand that our comfort comes from the God of comfort. You see, Paul encourages us by letting us know that we get our comfort, again, from the source of all comfort. And it's who comforts us in not some of our tribulations, not a few of our tribulations, but in all our tribulations. And in other words, there's no category of a tribulation that you can have that he can't comfort. It doesn't matter how great it is or how minor it is. There's nothing that you can go through that he can't comfort. Now, this word tribulation, there's a Greek word for it. It's called philipsis. And there's another term for it, and the, and the word is affliction. In other words, he comforts us in all our afflictions as well. There is not any suffering that you can endure that he cannot provide comfort for. In Psalm 46 and 1, he says, God is our refuge and our strength a very present help in trouble. The second question that he answers is, he asks the question, well, why does he comfort us? And we see that again. We see that right here in the scripture. It says that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. I want you to pay attention to that word able. He didn't say that so that we can comfort those. He says so that we are able to comfort those. That means that comfort, when we are comforted, when he comforts us, that qualifies us to be able to comfort somebody else because he comforts us through the help of the Holy Spirit. And what does that do? It reminds us of God's word. It reminds us of God's word. The Holy Spirit comes to remind us of all things that Jesus has said to us. It's our helper in the time of need. So we go to the word of God and we're able to, and we're comforted by that. And we take that same comfort that we receive from the word of God and we take it and comfort others who are in any trouble. He said that our, he said he comforts us who are in all, all of our, our tribulations so that we can comfort those that, in, that are in any trouble. A preacher by the name of John Henry Joette, he was a great preacher of the early 1900s. Now, some say that he was actually the greatest preacher of the English-speaking world. That's pretty high praise for a preacher. But it says, what well, he said one time while speaking on the topic of suffering, he said, God doesn't comfort us to make us comfortable. He comforts us to make us comforters. So he takes us from being comforted to being comforters. You see, God doesn't just comfort us just to get us through our distresses. You know, okay, you got through that one. Whew, that's it. Man, now I can go and be, I don't have to be inconvenienced anymore. I don't have to uh, suffer anymore. I can, that's behind me now. I can go and live my life. That's not why God comforts us. God comforts us so that we can get through it, and he gives us a burden to comfort others. That's why he comforts us. He makes us, he gets us to be comforted in order for us to become comforters. So no matter what trouble you are facing, God comforts you so that you will be able, qualified to comfort other people. And then the third question, and the third question is this, how do we comfort them? Well, Paul has said it over and over again. He's the God of all comfort. So it's with the comfort, it's right here in the verse, with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. The word of God is the power. It's not our ideas. It's not our thoughts. It's not our own wisdom. The word of God is the power. That's what comforts us. When you go in to speak to somebody who's in the hospital, or when you go to speak to somebody who was going through, the thing that comforts them is when we begin to share the scripture, and we begin to comfort them through the scripture that encourages us. That's where the power is, because it's the scriptures that can build us up. It's the scriptures that can comfort that, 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 that troubled heart. The power is in the word of God. In Psalm 119 and 50, David said, this is my comfort in affliction. Your word has given me life. And then in Psalm 119 and 28, he said, my soul melts from heaviness. Strengthen me according to your word. So in verse 5, so now we go down to verse 5. And Paul now talks about, he shifts a little bit. 
He gets into something concerning the abundance of the trials that we go through. Look at what it says. Notice what it says in verse 5. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation or our comfort also abounds through Christ. So what is he saying to us? He's saying that there is an abundance of trials that we can look forward to. Abundance of trials and tribulations. We're not going to just suffer one and that's it. You're not going to just suffer one and you check off that box and say, okay, I ain't got to go through these anymore. I'm done. No. Sometimes, if you're anything like me, sometimes you feel like a trial comes every other six minutes. I mean, it, it, it just seems and sometimes that you just get bombarded. You bombard it with trials and tribulations, bombard it with afflictions. It's like, when does it stop? So there is an abundance of trials and tribulations that we suffer. And sometimes we suffer, there's, we suffer those in, uh, on behalf of Jesus Christ. But the good news is this. We also have an abundance of comfort through Jesus Christ. Psalm 34 and 19 he, uh, uh, David says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Yeah, we're going to go through a lot of trouble. We're going to go through a lot of afflictions. But the promise is that the Lord delivers us out of them all. And if you look back, the very fact that you're sitting here, you can probably think back a year or two, five years, <laughs> some of us this morning, that the Lord has delivered us from trials or tribulations. Thank God. And you know what? When we go through these trials and when we suffer with God, sometimes it's almost like it's that fellowship. It's we're in close fellowship with Jesus Christ because we, at that time we can identify with him and his suffering. And it's almost like a, it's, a, it's a fellowship. We feel closer when you're pressing in because, see, we don't, we don't have a high priest who can't be touched with our infirmities. So he knows what we're talking about when we go before him and we cry out to him and we ask him for help. He knows what, he, what we're talking about. He knows what we're feeling. So it's that fellowship. Paul said in Philippians 3 and 10, he says that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his suffering. There will never be a time when our need for God's comfort will ever exceed God's supply of comfort. Never be a time. You'll never hear God say, I'm sorry, I'm all out. That won't ever happen. We cannot exceed his supply of comfort. And then in verse 6 and 7, he says, Now, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer." Or, if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. That word consolation can also be termed comfort. So it's comfort and salvation. And verse 7 says, And our hope for you is steadfast, because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will partake of the consolation or the comfort. You see, what Paul is saying to us here is that in his affliction, or in our affliction, it is actually for the benefit for somebody else, for the rest of the body. The body benefits. And it's true because we see it right here in our own church. We have people who go through afflictions. And when we watch how they go through it, when we watch their faith, when we watch them clinging to the word of God, that builds us up. That builds us up. We benefit from that. So when we go through those very same sufferings, we now have a way of dealing with it because we've been built up by watching somebody else walk through those dark, those deep waters. Oh, bless the Lord. You see, the Holy Spirit doesn't just come and agree like sympathy does. The Holy Spirit comes to strengthen and to sustain us in our suffering. Amen. So we go into verse 8 and 9. Before, you know, see, Paul had many experiences with suffering during his walk. i got to check the time because my wife told me that I'm long-winded. Um, and um, I know when it comes to the things of the Lord, I probably, I'm probably guilty of that. So Paul has, has had many experiences with suffering during his walk with the Lord. 
In fact, if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 through 27, Paul has a resume <laughs> that he has of his suffering and the things that he's gone through. But you know, and I'm sure that's not a complete resume, but yet it's enough. But here in verse, uh, here in verse 8, Paul recounts an experience of suffering that he had in Asia. Notice what it says here in verse 8. He says, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Now, what I want you to do is to look at the picture words. Look at the picture words that Paul uses here. He says, burdened beyond measure, above strength. That's a picture phrase. And it's a picture of a beast of burden. Now, back in the Jewish times, they had many beasts of burdens. They had, an ox was considered a beast of burden. Anything that carried loads were a beast of burden. An ox, donkeys, mules, and camels. For our purposes today, I'm going to use the camel. And the reason why I like using the camel is because when, they, when a camel carries a load, the people train the camel to get down on their knees. And then they load the camel up. And then after they load the camel up, the camel gets up, goes to the neck, go to the destination, and then he gets down on his knees again. And they roll the burden off of the camel. That's a whole nother message. Rolling away their approach, that's a whole nother message. But he roll, they roll the load off of him. They roll away that heaviness. But this particular picture, Paul is saying that my experience in Asia, my suffering in Asia was so heavy that it was beyond what I was able to handle. It was beyond what I was able to lift. I couldn't do this in my own strength. And he said that it was above strength. And to me, that's a picture phrase. It's a phrase of lifting weights. And like I said earlier, I used to do that a long time ago, obviously, but I used to lift weights. And when you put too much on a bar where you can't lift it yourself, you can't even move it. You're just under that weight. And that's the picture word that I have of Paul being when he says it's above strength. That means it's above what I am able to lift by myself. I'm not able to bear it. And then he uses another picture word. He uses the word despaired, even of life. That word despaired. It's translated in a few different terms. It's translated being, meaning without a way or being without a way. It's also translated to be at a loss or it's translated to be without resource. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever in your time suffered? to a point, or had an affliction, or an experience of a tribulation where you felt that the weight was too much for you to bear? Where it was so heavy that you, I mean, it took everything you could just to get out of bed? Have you ever had that experience of it just being too much? This is what Paul is talking about. Without resource, when they say there's no way out, that's like being in a room with danger and there's no doors. There's no doors. There's no way to escape it. But Paul doesn't, now even though Paul doesn't give specifics about just what this experience is, but one of the things that we get from this is that evidently he thought he was going to die. Look at what it says down here at the bottom of verse 9. He said, yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Paul is saying, you know what? This is a done deal. I'm not coming out of this. I'm not coming out of this. But I do trust in the God who can raise me up even if, I'm, even if I die. What Paul is saying here is that I have exhausted all of my uh, 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 wisdom. I've exhausted all of my resources. And you know what? That's where God wants us. He wants us at that point where we have come to the end of ourselves because that's where he starts. That's where he begins. It may be too heavy for us, 
but it's not too heavy for God. Yeah, when we come to the point where we don't have, you know, it, when it, you know, our abilities doesn't count, our gifts doesn't count, our experiences, that doesn't get us out of it. It's only in what Jesus will do for us. There's another quote that I used to hear when I was, a, when I was young, and, um, I, I, and I heard it recently. It says, you know, we don't know that Jesus is all we need until Jesus is all we have. Yeah, some, some of the more mature people in the group probably heard that quote before. And it's so true. We don't know the resource we have in Jesus until the only resource we have is Jesus. And this is what Paul was dealing with here. So it was heavy. You know, yes, it can be heavy for us to bear sometimes and hard for us to get out of bed. But God can strengthen us. You see, in, 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 in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse 10, Paul says, For when I am weak, then am I strong. I'm the strongest I've ever been when I'm weak. When I allow the strength of Jesus Christ to, to function in me. In Isaiah chapter 40, in verse 29, the Bible says that he, meaning God, gives, gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Yes. Our suffering can cause us to feel in despair sometimes and that there's no way out or to make us feel hopeless or helpless. But God always has a way out. We can always hope in God. Psalm, uh, the, 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 the other scripture that I really love, and I call it, thank God for the comma, every time I read this scripture. And you'll see why in a minute. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, we see where it says, and I'm going to read it just how it is. We are hard pressed on every side, comma, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, comma, but not in despair. Persecuted, comma, but not forsaken. Struck down, comma, but not destroyed. That's why I say thank God for the comma. Because it's what's on the other side of that comma that gives us hope. It's not what's on in front of it, but it's what's on the other side of it that gives us hope. Wouldn't it be awful if it read like this? We are hard pressed on every side, period. We are perplexed, period. We are persecuted, period. We're struck down, period. Wouldn't that be horrible? But God gives us hope on the other side of that comma. And if you look back through your life, you will see where you've had a lot of commas in your life, where you thought it was going to be a period, when you thought it was over. But God said, no, it ain't over till I say it's over. No, yes, you were in distress, but comma, I'm going to deliver you. You have been delivered. How many times in your life? Thank God for the commas in your life. The commas. And guess what? Every time you come through that, you are strengthened. And God sustains you. You are prepared to now be a comforter and go and sustain and strengthen somebody else through the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So we're closing up. Now, the, 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 the um, praise and worship team can come forward. We're at verse 10. And what it says here in verse 10, I'm just going to read it because Paul kind of does something a little different here in verse 10. He says, who delivered us? So now Paul is acknowledging something here. He says, who delivered us? From so great a death, whatever that was, was really, really intense. Delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. What Paul is saying here is that these circumstances that he went through, yes, they were tough. They were grave. It was a rough affliction. It was a bad experience. Paul said, I was, you know, he, he, he despaired even to death, thought he was going to die. But once again, God delivered him. He gave Paul another comma. God delivered him out of the jaws of death. You see, God was always in control. Paul didn't know it. He may not have realized it, but God was always in control. It may have appeared that it was hopeless for Paul, but it wasn't hopeless. It was never hopeless for the Lord. Paul was able, and then Paul was able to acknowledge that, yes, God delivered me. He delivered me out of that in the past. And you know what? He said he is currently delivering me, and I'm going to trust that he will deliver me in the future. You see, sometimes we just need to take time 
to think about the things that God brought us through and how he delivered us. Oh, when you're suffering, (laughs) when you're suffering, the last thing that you need to do is to run away from God. The last thing you need to do is to stop coming to church. The last thing you need to do is to stop praying. The last thing you need to do is to stop reading your word. You need to sit back, get into the word of God, pray, and then thank God for the things that he brought you through up to this point. And then thank God that he is still delivering you, even right now. And then give God praise, even for what he'll do for you. You're going to trust him to do for you even in the future. Psalm 91 says it this way. He said, God is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. And then in verse 11, Paul acknowledges the prayers of the saints. You see, one of the most important things when we're going through and to be involved with a church body are the prayers that go up on our behalf and the prayers that go up on someone else's behalf. Every Sunday at five o'clock, we have intercessors in this house that's lifting up the issues of of this house, lifting up our leadership, lifting up our pastor, lifting up our families, lifting up the country and the government, lifting up each other. And those hands, and those hands are lifting up and helping each other to hold the burden. So when you think back, to what we said about being able, not being able to hold the burden yourself and being under pressure. We think back about that scripture of being beyond measure. Then you think about what intercessory prayer does. Because what intercessory prayer does, it's like having more hands to push that weight up with you. When the people are praying, they are pushing up the issue away from you, helping you to lift it, helping you to lift that burden. That's the blessing of having many. And Paul said it this way. He says, he says, you also helping together in prayer for us that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. Paul said, you know what? It was, it was greatly, my deliverance was greatly in part due to the intercessory prayer to the saints praying on my behalf. So God comforts us to be comforters. And if you are going something right now, let me encourage you, don't run away from God. Don't stop coming to the house of the Lord. This is a fellowship. Don't stop coming to the house of the Lord. Don't stop praying. Don't stop reading your word. Press in even harder. Press in. Get up a little earlier. Stay up a little later. Whatever it takes. But stay connected to the Lord. And not only that, but if you have been delivered from something, let me encourage you. Let me encourage you to press in and and deliver somebody else. And if you've not been delivered, but if you're going through something right now, let me encourage you to get into the Word of God so that the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, could then comfort you so that you will be able to comfort someone else. Amen.